gold standard. Welcome to the Dr. Hedberg Show for cutting-edge practical health information. For the latest articles, videos, and podcasts, visit drhedberg.com. That's D-R-H-E-D-B-E-R-G.com. The information in this show is intended for educational purposes only. Always consult your healthcare professional before attempting anything recommended in this program. And now, here's Dr. Hedberg. Well, welcome everyone. This is Dr. Hedberg and welcome to the Dr. Hedberg Show. Very excited today to have Shannon Garrett on the show. I've been wanting to have her on the show for a while to talk about Hashimoto's. And Shannon is an autoimmune thyroid wellness nurse expert and certified functional nurse nutritionist. She is a Hashimoto's patient herself, advocate, and educator who has dedicated her career to helping women diagnosed with Hashimoto's live their best life. She is the author of the Hashi Sisters Guide to LDN, Hashimoto's Finding Joy in the Journey, and soon to be released book in 2018 entitled Hashimoto's R&R. Shannon's a member of the Institute of Functional Medicine, the American Holistic Nurses Association, and the National Nurses Business Association. She also serves on the advisory board of heyhashi.org and is a volunteer advocate for the use of low-dose naltrexone in autoimmune thyroid disease. She's most well-known as an LDN nurse educator and is a featured expert on ldnresearchtrust.org website. Shannon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Hedberg. I'm excited to be with you today. I'm excited as well. So why don't we start with you just talking about your personal journey dealing with Hashimoto's disease. Sure. Um, First, I'll say that, um, you know, my entire life I was influenced as a young child by one of my grandmothers who was extremely knowledgeable. She was a scholar herself. Um, She had a great influence on my thinking about health and wellness, you know, even from the 1960s. So I'm kind of giving away my age here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But she knew everything about every vitamin, what it did in the body, what the signs of deficiency were. Uh, You know, no one uh, in my realm talked or thought the way that she did. So that impressed upon me, you know, the importance of health and taking care of the body, um, you know, in ways that no one else at that time was thinking. So, you know, I guess as a teen and younger woman in my 20s, in many uh, ways, I was sort of a go-to person for what to do when you're sick, you know, uh, friends, family, whoever, what can I take, you know, to feel better? I don't want to take medication or whatever. So I really felt like I had a lot of knowledge. I, I always joke and say I probably had a PhD in nutrients <laughs> in, <laughs> from from my teen years, thanks to my grandmother. But um, so I was always a woman who took really good care of myself. Um, I never really had any uh, childhood illnesses. I never had the chicken pox, even though I was exposed, which, you know, could have been um, hmm. a, 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 a red flag had we been talking about these issues during the 70s and whatnot. Um, but the fact that my immune system did not respond the way it should in certain uh, cases uh, probably plays a role in my development of autoimmunity. I'm not sure. Nonetheless, um, in the 90s, before Facebook even existed, you know, and we didn't have these online communities to connect with people, uh, Mm -hmm. I started experiencing, oh, I went literally eight years undiagnosed, basically. I had extreme fatigue. My hair was falling out, weight gain without changing anything else in my life. And seriously, Dr. Hedberg, leading up to this, I was active. I was fit. Um, I exercised every day. Uh, I felt I was the, you know, image of what health, 
healthy means, you know, for a woman. Mm-hmm. I didn't starve myself. I, you know, I, I was just healthy, um, vitality. I had it all. <laughs> I had a career, right. a very successful career as a young woman. You know, I, I had a um, orthopedic facility that I founded, owned, and operated myself with a team of several people in a brick and mortar building. Um, you know, on the outside looking in, I had it all, but I was breaking down on the inside. My stress and anxiety was through the roof. Um, as I said, the fatigue at one point in the journey, oh, I I couldn't even take a simple, you know, walk without just extreme muscle pain, calf pain that would just stop me in my tracks. I was tested several times for a um, you know, condition called claudication that's more commonly seen in elderly people who have vascular disorders. Uh, but that's all the doctors at the time could come up with, even though I tested negative. Um, I did see approximately nine doctors during that eight year period. And, um, you know, it was all you may be a little hypothyroid, but really we think this is depression <laughs> and you just need to uh-huh. eat less and exercise more. That's what seriously what I got from everybody. So looking back, you know, just the mere fact that I could not connect with anyone else who was going through what I was going through was an extremely lonely, isolating and fearful time. You know, I lost nearly a decade to this crazy thing called Hashimoto's and, um, wasn't able to have children. And when I came out of it, and I finally did get correctly diagnosed, um, not only did I have Hashimoto's, but also had pernicious anemia and celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So I went through um, some emotions that, you know, one may not have expected, you know, although I was thrilled to be diagnosed and it validated, yes, there is truly something wrong here. I was also very angry, frustrated, and irritated toward those doctors who could not or would not help me, you know, so it was just an emotional challenge to the ninth power Uh, and frustrating. And, you know, as a nurse, I thought, oh my gosh, is this the, is this really the best the medical system has to offer? You know, I know how to navigate the healthcare system. I know how to advocate for myself and 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 speak in SBAR format to doctors to explain the situation intelligently. And if this happened to me, what in the world is happening, you know, to women who don't know how to navigate the healthcare system and communicate with their doctors in the way that they should? So I really took a turn in my career and my personal endeavors to really, um, you know, hone in on what I wanted to do in life with this, this gift, this blessing of having been tortured (laughs) for eight Mm -hmm. years to, to move that forward and really help other women in a way that's useful. Right. So it's interesting because you talked about going through a stressful period. And I know that's something that I see a lot. and I'm sure you see a lot preceding the onset of Hashimoto's or any illness. Is there anything else you wanted to? Yeah. So let me comment on that. When we say stress, I want to say this because there may be a woman out there who hears this and she realizes what she's going through is, you know, that validates what she's going through. So when I say stress, I truly thought something was wrong with me that's possibly going to be fatal that they're just not finding. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. as far as the stress and anxiety, so I could be driving a car going along just fine and all of a sudden feel extreme, um, sort of not really dizzy, but just off to the point that I felt like I was floating and would Mm -hmm. need to pull off, you know, on the interstate or the road, wherever I was, I can remember pulling into a bank parking lot, just sitting there in sheer panic 
and, you know, and wondering what in the world is wrong with me <laughs> and scared, um, you know, afraid to go out in public to the grocery or shopping or whatever, because you're, you're afraid something's going to happen. You don't know what that something is, but you're afraid, you know, oh my gosh, if I get out, you know, and that happens again, I may pass out and embarrass myself because the doctors aren't finding anything wrong. So it must be really, you know, in my head. Well, it's not. I hear this over and over from women that the dizziness, the lightheadedness, the, the fear, just sheer anxiety. And then it compounds Mm -hmm. because even though, you know, during that time, I also did learn coping mechanisms from, um, Another nurse, Lucinda Bassett, who um, with Dr. Fisher founded the Midwest Center for Stress and Anxiety. And I learned the tools to cope through those stressful periods. Um, But that wasn't getting to the root cause, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just wanted to share that because it is when we say stress and anxiety, you know, how do we quantify that? How do we define what it means? And I just wanted to share with with um, your listeners that um, those really scary stress and anxiety moments of floating, spinning, dizziness um, is real and common. It's very scary because you don't know necessarily what's causing it or if it's going to be there forever you know all these things go through your mind when you're suffering and if you don't mind uh, me asking one of the things that I see is a lot of issues in childhood and there's a tremendous amount of research coming out on this on early adverse life events was there anything that happened to you or that you went through as a kid that you could connect to developing Hashimoto's as an adult, say a lot of antibiotics or something going on in your family or anything like that? Um, I wouldn't say it's related to any medication or anything like that, but um, this is a, this is, you could say this is um, an adverse child event for sure. So you have Mm -hmm. perfectionistic parents who are type A who also may be alcoholic, um, which I did have one parent who is alcoholic, my father. Um, and combine that with, you know, everyone's telling you as a young girl and young woman how beautiful you are every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, some may say, that sounds, <laughs> what's wrong with that? Well, you grow into those things combined. You grow into putting yourself in a pressure cooker every day because all of a sudden you you're you're smart you're intelligent you're in school that was me so I had to keep that pace up all the time I told myself every day I've got to keep this up or my parents won't love me Um, I've got to stay beautiful or whatever one's definition of beautiful is that has to be kept up always because people won't love you so it was just Mm -hmm. um that type of intense pressure, I think, is, you know, it has adverse effects because the child's mind, uh, we don't have our, what, our frontal lobe doesn't de- fully develop till 25 or so. <laughs> so mm-hmm. just dealing with right. those adult pressures onto a child, projected onto a child, um, does have adverse effects. So I definitely think it played a role. For sure, because if I couldn't meet those things that I thought I needed to, then I would be rejected. So I think in many ways. Oh, and one more thing, you know, having perfectionistic parents and a father who alcoholic yelled a lot. You know, if if you stepped out of line or whatever, um, I felt like I had no voice in my home. So. That's interesting because, you know, where is our, where does our voice, where is our voice box? It's very near our thyroid. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, um, and even today, the expectation to look attractive, you know, it's like the things we women do to our bodies sometimes, or think we need to change our bodies to look a certain way, or we're not happy with our weight or whatever the case may be. That is a form of self-rejection. 
Um, so, mm-hmm. um, but yes, I agree with you on the adverse childhood events. I've studied that a lot, particularly as it relates to cardiac disease. And um, it's something I think that we need to be paying a lot more attention to. We do. And those studies that I mentioned, a lot of them indicate the big differences between how those events affect women versus men. And also the the microbiome, which is, as we know, uh, intimately connected with the immune system and autoimmunity. So there's all those changes that happen in the brain. Like you said, prefrontal cortex not even developed until 25. And then the limbic air system, the areas of the brain, like the amygdala and uh, places mm-hmm. like that, Um you get some abnormal pathways and development there. And then you connect that with the gut brain axis and the changes in the, in the microbiome. And it's no wonder, you know, so many people develop autoimmunity. And then of course, women develop autoimmunity at such a greater rate than, uh, than men for those Mm -hmm. reasons. So, so your book, your book is, called Hashimoto's Finding Joy in the Journey. You discussed all these uh, different shades and stages of Hashimoto. So what do you, why don't you talk a little bit more about those shades and stages? Sure. It's interesting uh, because, you know, even though we have so many resources out there for Hashimoto's to learn, you know, for a woman to learn what she can do to get better, um, what I find in many of my clients is that they've done every protocol out there and they're getting nowhere. (laughs) And it's really because they're not understanding where they are and they're not understanding that, you know, just like with cancer, um, one lady's experience with Hashimoto's and um, all the factors that play a role aren't necessarily applicable to her. So, What I have sort of seen in my own work is that, um, you know, you may have someone who is newly diagnosed and many doctors are testing for antibodies now, whether they're symptoms or not, which is great, but perhaps a young woman is newly diagnosed and she has no symptoms. Um, you know, that, that's that's one aspect of a, the, a shade. Then you have a newly diagnosed who has had symptoms for years, you know, such as where I was. Um, you have someone who's in the maintenance phase. You have someone who's in the ready and willingness phase to get better and they're seeking for interventions. Um, then you have someone who's been in maintenance or they've relapsed, uh, which is not discussed often. We think there's an end point to Hashimoto's of being fully healed and that it won't remit. And that's not true. Um, So we have with all of these phases of Hashimoto's, we also have emotions that tie in with those that are very, um, they correlate with what I refer to as, you know, um, grief emotions. So, for example, when someone is in the uh, phase where they've been diagnosed, but they have no symptoms, of course, they're probably going to be in the grief stage of denial. Um, What I want women to understand is, is Hashimoto's is really as much an emotional journey as it is physical. And, you know, addressing your emotions Mm -hmm. Um, are as important as what we do, nutrition, nutraceutical use, any other interventions. I'm so glad that you said that because I was going to ask your opinion and and advice on, on this particular topic because one of the things that happens when I'm working with patients is there's a very clear uh, psychological component to their Mm -hmm. condition And that's just outside of my area of expertise. So I do refer a lot for different types of therapy, whether it's um, cognitive behavioral therapy or EMDR or just traditional counseling. And 
How do you deal with with uh, patients who they get upset or angry or they think that you're saying that that it's all in their head? And I do my best to explain that that's not what I'm saying, and I explain how the brain and our emotions, our thoughts, all those things affect biochemistry. So how do you how do you approach that? What do you think is most effective? Yes, in your well, experience? first of all, I think it's really important to meet clients where they are. Um, I do a pretty comprehensive readiness and willingness assessment. And what I have found is not every woman is willing and ready um, to proceed with complicated protocols. So Mm -hmm. what I have found through working with clients for the past five years is that the degree to which and I hate to say this, but the degree to which they are truly miserable aligns with their motivation to be ready and willing to proceed with protocols and trust their practitioner to guide them. Um, Mm -hmm. If they're not ready and willing to invest in the time and So back to the grief emotions, you know, they've got to reach the stage of acceptance (laughs) before, before that, before we can really help them. You know, they're the ones who are going to be doing all the work, not us. We're simply holding their hand Mm -hmm. and guiding them and giving them our best, you know, expertise and judgment based on what we see going on with their labs, nutrition, lifestyle, everything. And, um, you know, back to the emotions of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, This these definitely apply to the stages of Hashimoto's, the emotional journey. Because, you know, they we do go through denial. Um, I've had women who clearly have Hashimoto's, Maybe they have a few symptoms, but they just, they're not miserable enough (laughs) to act on any type of protocol. The most they will do is maybe take their thyroid medication and that's it. So um, I just let them know I'm always here for them when they're ready. Um, I try to at least get them on uh, nutrition that is suitable for them, individualized. Um, but you know, with the, with a grief phase of anger, for example, that's definitely what I experienced when I was finally diagnosed anger towards practitioners, anger towards myself for, you know, I thought, well, as I said earlier, I have always been so health conscious and, and took care of myself. How could this possibly happen? What did I do to myself for this to happen? You have bargaining, right. um, women and myself. If I do this, this, and this, I will get remission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and there is some depression we have to go through, but then we, when we finally get to acceptance, that's when, you know, uh, the patients can really, um, really move forward. Mm-hmm. So you talked about grief. Why don't can you talk a little bit more about those stages of grief and specifically how they would apply to sure. Hashimoto's? So, um, there's a lot of information out there, and thankfully, you know, as I said earlier, doctors are testing for antibodies. Some are s- still won't, but um, many are, and that denial phase is is really a s- strong influence, particularly when a woman has no symptoms or she's not identifying uh, fatigue and hair loss um, as something being related to autoimmunity. Uh, they may relate it to just the thyroid. And as long as I just, as long as I take my thyroid medication, this thing's just going to go away. And, 
that's also a strong factor when their practitioner also is validating that <clears throat> you really only need to take this thyroid medication. Hashimoto's can't be reversed. I hear this all the time, um, you know, where where ladies are working with conventional practitioners and they're being told it can't be reversed. Um, mm -hmm. Anger. Anger's huge. Like I said, um, when women come out of the stress and anxiety phases, this often leads into emotions of anger. Um, and that can be quite compelling uh, and destructive, of course, to the autoimmune process in general. Uh, as I said earlier, the bargaining phase, you know, maybe they're also in a little bit of acceptance at that time as well. But they're like, oh, OK, if I do what so-and-so says or this person says, you know, um, without working with someone to guide them, they just uh, feel hopeful as well. But they're bargaining. I'll do this. This will happen because that's, you know, what they're being taught. Mm -hmm. Depression. Um, can occur, you know, at the diagnosis, if the miserable quotient is there, um, but also falling into relapse can be quite depressing. You know, there could be trigger factors that could have caused that. Um, and then acceptance is just a beautiful thing because that's where your, your wounds of Hashimoto's have really manifested into a blessing uh, where you end up really becoming more grateful for your health and how does this make sense um, ready to move forward and help mm -hmm. other people if that makes sense I have I feel like so many women I have worked with Dr. Hedberg have become inspired themselves um, when they reach acceptance and they they've maybe they're not in remission but their symptom burden is much less and they want to pay it forward. Many of my clients are becoming health coaches and, you know, nutritionists and they, they want to help other people. Mm -hmm. I right. also find right. that women have a problem with what I call the FLT triangle, <laughs> uh, for forgiveness, mm -hmm. love and trust. Yes. <laughs> and one of my assessments is, you know, <clears throat> I'll ask a woman, um, do you, do you feel like you love yourself the same way you do your child or a friend or your spouse, your parents? Can you, can you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I love you, you know, and most cannot, they don't feel they're worthy of mm -hmm. loving themselves. And, um, that's unfortunate because it's, it's really important to forgive. So I had to forgive all those doctors who couldn't or wouldn't help me. And that was hard. <laughs> Very hard. Mm -hmm. um, right. I had to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. I had to forgive my parents. I had to forgive my past. The one thing I, I believe is that forgiveness and trust equals love. So you can't have love without forgiving, whatever it is, the situation, the people, the disease, all of it. And trusting, you know, that you can heal will ultimately lead you to love. And with love and the final phase of uh, grief, which is acceptance, you can really move mountains in terms of your healing because it's definitely not all about mm -hmm. the physical. That's exactly right. And I'm glad you said that because, you know, like you said, a lot of uh, people's expectations are related to diet and supplementation and things like that. But all these things that you talked about are just as important. And I'm sure you see that unless those areas are addressed equally, um, you know, patients will hit a sticking point or they'll only get so far in their healing process. Mm -hmm. So I like that FLT. Um, let's shift a little bit into medication. So why don't you talk a little bit about LDN 
And in your in your expert opinion, do you think LDN is suitable for everyone Absolutely with Hashimoto? Not. <laughs> and I say that because um, you know I went back to the I go back to the readiness and willingness. So you know, first of all, a patient has to be committed to getting their body ready for LDN. Um, I'm so glad that th- we have more awareness on LDN now. Uh, than what we used to. But what I also see is there are many practitioners out there who, okay, maybe they've heard about it. They have this patient before them who's asking for it and it seems rational and they don't understand the unique protocol for Hashimoto's and they certainly don't invest the time in, um, let's see, being available to assess their hemodynamic status (laughs) while they're titrating their dose. But also, if if someone isn't necessarily willing to commit to a medication that may be for a lifetime, which LDN typically is, uh, they're not going to be a candidate. Um, if they're not willing to change their diet and eliminate sugar, uh, they won't be a candidate. So, if they're not willing to mm-hmm. follow through with the at-home self-assessments that I use when when we initially start LDN, they're probably not a candidate. So a lot of it is self-responsibility and commitment. Um, having said that, if they are candidates, it can it's a wonderful intervention. Now, it does not work for everyone. We don't always necessarily know why it doesn't. Um, I found remission with it. It's not something I would have turned to early on in my diagnosis for sure. Had I known about it then, I don't think I would have opted for another lifetime medication necessarily. Um, but it, it is um, beneficial. It, it, it's helpful for many pain syndromes as well. Um, but, um, it is, it's not for everyone. Now, I, as I said, I did find remission with it. In full disclosure, um, I was running my Hashi Sisters secret Facebook group, and we are currently doing um, the Inositol challenge that I set up a few months ago. So mm-hmm. I have um, discontinued LDN since I'm doing the Inositol challenge with my group, and um, I'll retest and I think it's February when it will have been six months, but I have not have had or experienced any negative issues having stopped LDN. Mm. Yes. The, uh, inositol, that was something I added once that mm-hmm. paper was released, um, on inositol and Hashimoto's and Correct. I believe it was 600, 600. milligrams mm-hmm. for six months. Yeah. So I'll be interested to know the results of that and your, yes. And the people I can't doing wait to it see their results. Um, some, actually most were not on LDN. I'm doing it because I wanted to see if I stayed in remission. Um, but I have, promised to share my lab results online at the end and and I can't wait to see what it Mm -hmm. is but seriously I have not had any complications or return of symptoms excellent so every practitioner is a little bit different there is some somewhat a consensus about nutrition and Hashimoto's but let's talk about your specific recommendations for nutrition yeah, so, and Hashimoto's. Excuse me. Um, I don't necessarily advocate for autoimmune paleo. It really depends on <clears throat> where a woman is coming from in terms of her normal diet. So I try to make it individualized. I do testing. Um, I use the ALCAT test. I know some pr- practitioners use others, but I have found it to be very useful. Obviously, I ask them to remove gluten, soy, wheat, GMO, corn, and dairy and support them in, you know, tons of recipes um, to help them make that transition. 
focusing on anti-inflammatory foods. But really, if, um, if their testing doesn't show that they're sensitive to, for example, you know, um, eggplant, <laughs> I don't necessarily remove foods that are right. nutrient dense. And, and I have found that um, I found a lot mm-hmm. of success with that. Now, I, I do ask that they keep those in moderation if they have joint pain or anything like that already. But I also use a tool called NutriQ um, that's, that's very helpful. I don't know if you're familiar with that tool, but it's a great self-assessment of 250 questions a patient can take online. And uh, it gives a awesome report on what their symptom burden is. And it shows it in a quantitative measure, but also in a graph form, which really is helpful in explaining to the patient what their symptom burden is and how initiating nutrition protocols, you know, can address each of those, whatever the case may be, whether it be uh, depending on what NutriQ picks up on their immune system, uh, the small intestine, the large intestine, whatever areas um, are detected, and we can hone in on those through nutrition and targeted supplements. So that's really useful, but it, it's really individualized. You know, every on my intake forms, I notice that every patient almost is following autoimmune paleo, and they're they feel worse. Mm-hmm. And what I have noticed, I also right. do Spectre Cell, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what I have noticed is that um, yeah. AIP may be useful, in my opinion, for the woman newly diagnosed who's ready and willing to do something who's coming from a fast food diet. You know, in that case, it may be fantastic short term. But um, I have found that it results in nutri- nu- nutrient deficiencies, specifically thiamine um, that plays a role in energy and other nutraceuticals. So I think long-term, if a woman wants to commit to it long-term, she's going to need to be aware that um, it may increase her body's demand for supplemental nutrients. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, and it's also tends to be low carb, which of course is not great for everybody and not necessarily great for, for the thyroid. And I've seen that a lot where, you know, the auto, cause the autoimmune paleo, there aren't that many carbohydrate choices mm-hmm. other than some low glycemic fruits and sweet potatoes. And that's kind of it. And uh, a lot of women will just feel a lot better if they just start eating some rice or something like that, just some additional carbs. Just a quarter and, of brown uh, rice, yeah. you know, can make a so, difference in mood, um, mm-hmm. the way they feel, energy, definitely. Mm-hmm. So that was a NutriQ, on, and that's online. How do you spell that? Um, it's available, the Nutrition mm-hmm. Therapy okay, Association. Um is behind that program. It's a mm-hmm. practitioner only program and it's ex- extremely useful. It's just a, it's an excellent tool to include, you know, in your assessment. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So we've talked a little bit about nutrition and one additional note regarding nutrition that I'd like you to talk about. Uh, what are you doing to help guide women through these dietary changes? Is there anything else you'd like to add? I let them know, first of all, that they can trust me. There's no judgment. (laughs) You know, uh, I I do offer the food journals that I ask them to complete for me because I truly need to know, look, if you're having a Twinkie, uh, I'm not going to judge you in any fashion. You're just doing what you can to get by, but I need to know about it so that I can make appropriate substitutions based on your preferences to move you away from those things. I don't want to push women into feeling deprivated, you know, or that they're being denied foods that 
um, satisfy their palate. I want to be able to offer nutrient dense, delicious foods and snacks based on, you know, their already established habits um, to make the transition easier. Mm -hmm. So. Excellent. So you have uh, your new book and is there anything else you want to talk about coming up in 2018? A lot of the year off. Uh, in 2017 to work on some upcoming projects with my team. One of those is a new membership site for women with Hashimoto's. It's the Hashi Sisters member site. Um, I had closed the Facebook group <clears throat> this year also. Uh, sadly, it was a hard decision to make, but you know how running a, a Facebook group can be demanding and time consuming. Um, I loved interacting with the women and everything that I do, but we're moving towards a membership site and they're all very excited about this as well. So it will be launching. I have also founded the um, thyroid nurse network where um, I will be teaching nurses and nurse practitioners how to, if they're working in the clinical setting, they can learn how to work alongside their doctor and really support them in working with patients with Hashimoto's. So I have a lot of friends who are doctors and nurses, and I hate to use this term, but many doctors will say they just don't know what to do for Hashimoto's patients because we have so much baggage, you know, so if they can't treat it with here, take this medication and follow this diet and their symptoms keep returning or changing, they're they really don't know how to, to work with that. And I do know as a nurse that um, a strong, competent nurse um, can be, can be someone who is a voice in the doctor's ear to help guide, support, take on a lot of the work with the patients, you know, who have Hashimoto's and in knowing how to handle their various issues. And um, Tiffany, Tiffany, my assistant, and I sat down at the end of summer and she said, you know, Shannon, she, she takes all of our emails that come in through the website and categorizes them, you know, what they are. And she says, 90% of mm-hmm. the inquiries we're getting are from nurses <laughs> and nurse practitioners. They want to learn how to do what okay. you're doing <laughs> so that they can either become an independent consultant or strengthen their knowledge and their practice with their doctor. Um, the nursing process, you know, rooted in the scientific method is something, you know, nurses are so wore down in the clinical setting. If it's the hospital setting setting, and um, they they can they don't realize how much they can use mm-hmm. that knowledge to do really anything they want to to do. Um, but I want to empower them. I have a business track, a ninety day business track. If they want to become a nurse entrepreneur, and if they want to add nutrition and teach them how to do this, and also teach them how to do what I do. So that's the Thyroid Nurse Network, and it will evolve into Thyroid Nurse Consultants within the network that. Patients can reach out to by phone or text or whatever the case may be. It's it's going to be really something. Uh, and then my book, <laughs> Hashimoto's R and R, will be coming out third quarter mm-hmm. of twenty eighteen. That's excellent. So, with the yeah, with nurse practitioners. Um, growing and more and more direct access to them in, in various states. It sounds like it's going to be a great program because more and more women will be able to go directly to mm-hmm. uh, nurse practitioners without seeing a doctor and uh, get LDN or thyroid medication yes. and, and all the other things that, that you're teaching them. So <laughs> we have uh, the holidays coming up. Is there anything that, any tips you'd like to give or 
help uh, that would help women and, make it um, through the holidays. I'm preaching to the choir, as they say when I when I share these tips. Um, I mentioned Lucinda Bassett earlier from the Str- uh, Midwest Center for Stress and Anxiety, and one of the tips I learned from her that's really rings so true today is um, don't should on yourself. <laughs> All the sh- all the shoulds, you know, mm-hmm. during the holidays that particularly women, um, yeah, you know, carry is that it's detrimental. Um, Your how we react is something we can control. So we can choose to not be affected by all the stress and drama and excitement excitement even if it's good stress which is you stress is can have an effect on us you know uh, Mm -hmm. women with Hashimoto's so you can choose to not be affected Um, in terms of nutrition and exercise for me those are just (laughs) non-negotiable there is nothing that is more important than Mm -hmm. you know high quality nutrition throughout the day um, and at least some form of exercise, if not every day, every other day. Now, not anything too intense and over the top, but it's very important. I like yoga, um, Mm -hmm. walking in an indoor pool (laughs) in the winter is phenomenal. Um, Mm -hmm. And then just practice the art of saying no and saying yes to yourself. You know, don't fall for the drama that the retailers and, and uh, all those deep rooted, rooted childhood shoulds um, evoke upon you. They can trigger um, symptoms Mm -hmm. if you, if you fall for those pressures. So the hot, the holidays are a, a joyous time um, they are, they're also a sad time for many people. So I think just, you know, not over committing, saying no, um, you know, a lot of mothers especially want to make Christmas so perfect for their children. And if I can just run out and get that other gift, <laughs> you know, and they just really place a lot of pressure on themselves that they don't have to. Right. And you also have a yes, I do. A de-stress so uh, holiday we had hoped guide. it was going to be up today. It will be up in the morning, so it'll be up in the morning. Yes, de-stress the holidays. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, and yes, also a seven-day fatigue makeover challenge. Side. So the um, okay, the seven-day fatigue challenge. It's actually a makeover seven-day fatigue makeover challenge. Um, we wanted to run it now, and then Tiffany and I decided that's just really one more thing for women to do, and here we're teaching women to back off on, on taking on too many things. Mm-hmm. So um, January 1, uh-huh. um, we'll, we'll launch the uh, thyroid challenge, energy fatigue challenge, to help women overcome mm-hmm. any stress they had endured during the holidays. But it will, it's free. Um, It's amazing. I've got a daily video, um, some worksheets, tips and tools, and a couple of interviews sprinkled in. Um, And it will lead them to the membership site if they want to learn more about that as well. Excellent. Excellent. So we mentioned your book. Uh, Could you mention again when that will be out? And also talk more about okay, how people so Hashimoto's can find you R&R on the internet and your is, work. It's um, going to be available the third quarter of 2018. Um, my website is holisticthyroidcare.net. Mm-hmm. They can find me by .com as well. Um, I'm on Facebook, Holistic Thyroid Care, Instagram, Thyroid Nurse, and um Twitter is autoimmune RN is my channel. So I'm everywhere. <laughs> That's excellent. Yes. Very easy to find. And I will put uh, all that information in the show notes on drhedberg.com. 
so everyone can link to your information. Any last well, I parting hope words or thoughts you'd like to give to everyone? That I've discussed and shared today has, you know, been helpful. I hope it's fallen on the ears of women who truly do need to hear this. Um, I want to give them hope that you can get better um, and to not give up. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show with all this great information. I've certainly learned a lot and uh, I'll definitely be checking in with you about some of these things that we talked about. And like I said, we'll have everything up on drhedberg.com. So nobody's awesome. going to miss any of this. Thank you for having me. I've, I've really, I always enjoy talking with you, Dr. Hedberg. Yes, it's been a pleasure. All right. Well, take care, everyone. This is Dr. Hedberg. And thank you again to Shannon Garrett for being on the show. And we'll see you at the next podcast. Take care. If you enjoy the Dr. Hedberg show, you can support it by sharing each episode on your social media channels like Facebook and by leaving a review on iTunes. Please visit drhedberg.com. That's D-R-H-E-D-B-E-R-G.com to access the show notes and resources for today's episode.